Nigeria's COVID-19 tally rises above 12,000 as 315 new cases were added on Monday. Senator Ali Undume from Bernou South calls for civil servants' pay court in light of COVID-19. In international news, as thousands pay tributes to slain George Floyd in Houston, Texas, former police officer who cured him slumped with more than $1 million bill. And in sport, Brazil withdraws 2023 Women's World Cup bid. This is ANN News. I am Ola Jumoke Olatunji. Nigeria recorded 315 new cases of the deadly coronavirus disease on Monday. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control and CDC said in a tweet that Lagos recorded 128 cases, while the Federal Capital Territory followed with 34 cases. It also added that the total number of confirmed cases in the country now stands at 12,801. More than 4,000 patients have been discharged and 361 deaths recorded. Meanwhile, NCDC says Nigeria might just be starting to experience COVID-19. This was part of the agency's Director General, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazi, said at the House of Representatives on Monday. Members of the Presidential Task Force had appeared before a House Joint Committee. Dr. Hekwaza said, quote, We are still in the middle of a very, very bad outbreak. In fact, it is not likely that we are at the beginning of a very bad outbreak. This is the honest truth. And quote, the NTDC boss also debunked to rumors that his agency had spent millions of sensitization text messages to Nigerians. There is a call for slashing the wages of civil servants who are no longer going to work because of COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Ali Ndube, representing Bruno South in the National Assembly, said this during a media briefing in Maiduguri, the Bruno State Capital, on Monday. Ndube said this is necessary because state and federal governments are spending more now to sustain personal and non-personal costs. He said those civil servants who are not working at the moment should be paid less and given policies. The senator said the government should critically review its recurrence and personal expenditure, which he says consumes about 70% of the budget. He said more of that money should be put into capital projects. He said the personnel should be willing to sacrifice at this time when most of them are not going to work. And Dumas said there is no justification for being paid fully for a month in which an employee has not worked. The federal government says it is working to bring closer the timetables for the West African Examinations Council and the National Examination Council examinations. Minister of State for Education, Chukweme Kanwajuba, said so on Monday during the daily briefing of the Presidential Task Force for COVID-19. He said the ministry is working to bring the timetable closer than the six weeks it requires to complete the WIAC and the NECO examinations. Both WIAC and NECO examinations were indefinitely suspended by the government in April as a result of the new coronavirus pandemic. Football viewing centers and a long welcome in Ondo State. Governor Rotimi Akeredulu announced a ban on the centers on Monday during his weekly media charts in Akure. The governor said he was displeased with a continued flouting of restriction orders that has been responsible for subsequent rise in COVID-19 cases in the state. The governor said the ban would continue until further notice and warned all religious organizations to abide by the guidelines for worship to which they have agreed. Accredited said the governor's task force on COVID-19 and law enforcement agencies will ensure full enforcement of earlier regulations and the operation of main and community markets in the states. 
The COVID-19 lockdown in Jigawa State has been lifted and Governor Mohamed Badaru Abubaka has ordered the immediate opening of all weekly markets in the state. The governor said the action was necessary because of the decreasing number of positive coronavirus in the state. Governor Abubaka said in Dutsi on Monday, the state had recorded only seven cases throughout the state in the last week. He also said all but 61 of COVID-19 cases in the state have been discharged from the isolation center. The governor said lifting the ban should not stop people from strictly obeying all the advice of health experts to avoid community transmission. Governor Booker also announced that the state's molecular COVID-19 laboratory has been completed and awaiting accreditation for full operation. The Transmission Company of Nigeria, TCN, now has an active managing director and four executive directors. President Mohamed Buhari confirmed the appointments of Sule Abdulaziz as acting managing director and Victor Adewumi Maman Nawa, Ahmad Dutse and Justin Dodo as executive directors. The managing director's appointment was effective from May the 19th, while the effective date for the appointments of executive directors became effective since December the 27th last year. The appointments are for an initial four-year term. Former managing director Usma Mohammed was fired by the president last month. Coming up, African news. South African schools reopen after months long closure. And later, international news as thousands pay tribute to slain George Floyd in Houston, Texas. Former police officer who killed him slammed with more than $1 million bail. You are watching ANN. Everything is okay. Network is, is shaking. Whoa, whoa. Play me a romantic music. Whoa, whoa. Play me a romantic music. Maybe I should go. Don't let poor internet ruin special moments. Join the super fast and reliable 4G network and get double data. Lonely. Learn the watch. I miss the Welcome back. This is in News. South African schools reopened on Monday as part of a gradual loosening of restrictions imposed on the months-long COVID-19 lockdown. The reopening of schools had been delayed after teachers' union urged school staff to the file last week's government order. It said schools lack sufficient health and hygiene measures to keep educators and pupils safe. Correspondent Julie Schuer has the story. South African children braved the cold weather and restarted school under strict COVID-19 protocols. The first morning was not without hiccups as students were screened, scanned and sanitized before being let in. They were still fixing the um, toilets and water was stopped but for fixing. As far as provision of sanitizers in all the blocks, that's in place and that's good. In terms of your other requirements, your scanners that um, they do have, but I'm sure you saw they, they have a problem with, they're affected by the weather somehow, so that will have to be addressed as well. The social distancing in the class I'm satisfied with, it's 20 students per class. With the outbreak worsening, parents are anxious. Ah, I feel nervous about all this, but I have to calm down so that it does the same also. So he mustn't panic. So I need to like to support him and be there and just let him know that everything will be okay. This uh, pandemic is really scary. And then 
I'm nervous, but I, I think my children must must come back to school because this uh, academic year is very important for them. Even though I'm nervous, but something must be done at the end of the day. There were no hugs and handshake on the first day of school, but learners who've been home for three months were glad to be back. I'm feeling happy because we have we have long time at home, and at home we can't learn anything. I'm happy to be back at school because at home, the only thing I was doing is watching TV with my cousins, and my cousins used to go out, and my parents used to tell them not to go out, but I'm happy to be back at school. Private schools had a little more time to settle in with the help of technology. So the QR code is our screening tool that we all the boys have downloaded and the teachers have downloaded. Everyone is on the same um, database. So they put on their, they tick all their symptoms and then, we, then they come in and then we scan their QR code. If there is a child who is not well, we take the child to the screening, to the COVID clinic where we further screen them and assess them. So it's, it's been a very trying time both for the boys and the staff and they've they found it emotionally difficult and they found the uncertainty quite emotionally difficult. And so we, we need to keep on speaking to them, reassuring them as best we can. This year is certainly not lost and uh, we have a, a draft timetable for the matric exams from IB, uh, which is just slightly delayed. 1.6 million learners are returning to their classrooms this week. This will pave the way for the rest of the academic year and how other grades will be phased in. Protest against the police killing of American black man George Floyd and against racism have spread around the globe. Africa is not left out as protests have taken place in several African cities in the last two weeks. An African-American family that lives in Nairobi, Kenya, sat down with correspondent Asta Tor to give its perspective on race, especially as it affects blacks in the United States. Here in Kenya, African-American families continue to watch the developments of the ongoing U.S. protest. While they may be far away, the topics of police brutality and racial inequality are ones they're all too familiar with. To explore this, I sat down with the Piper family. Ben Piper comes from the U.S. city of Cleveland. For the last 13 years, he has called both Ethiopia and Kenya home. As he raises his family outside of the U.S., Ben is always aware of the obstacles they may face if they ever choose to live in America. My friends and I have had several circumstances where we've had unpleasant, to say the least, interactions with police, and we learn as a young person in the U.S. how to manage that, how to code switch and sound professional and educated so they treat you differently. And so now, from here, trying to have those conversations with my sons who understand America, but not really, and I haven't had that kind of interpersonal interaction with the police, which has been so unpleasant, but it's an important, for, for the, important thing for them to learn in case they decide to go back to the U.S. Ben and his wife, Lily, say they keep up with the ongoing protest as a family. The members of the Piper family aren't the only ones paying attention to what's going on in the U.S. From Ghana to Kenya and in between, solidarity protests have emerged. But this is nothing new. Africa and Black America have a long history of supporting each other's civil rights movements. To better understand this history, I sat down with Professor Nyambi Carter. Professor Carter, thanks for joining me. So, Black America has a long history of supporting Africa throughout its various civil rights movements. Can you give me an example of this? In South Africa, where we saw um, apartheid continue well into the 1990s, um, you had Black people in this country um, having, you know, South African scholars, for example, um, come teach in exile in, in, at HBCUs in the United States. You had um, uh, the Free South Africa movement holding protests in D.C. and all around this country. And I think it's also important to remember when, when Nelson Mandela was freed from prison after many, many years, um, one of the places he came was to the United States. It's this history of solidarity and action which Lily says she has taught her children throughout the years. Her eldest daughter is heading to the U.S. for her university education, and Lily hopes the lessons helped prepare her. 
Yeah, it's very possible that when she goes to the United States, her identity will be reduced down to a singular story. But as parents, we've tried to really root her in all the parts of what is beautiful about being black, um, her Ethiopian roots, her Cleveland roots. Ben says he hopes the tools they've given their children will prepare them for the world. When we return international news, thousands pay tributes to slain George Floyd in Houston, Texas. Former police officer who cured him slumped with more than $1 million bail. And later, sport. Brazil withdraws 2023 Women's World Cup bid. You are watching ANN. We are on the road every day, canvassing throughout Africa for news you really need. We follow this story everywhere, from every corner of Nigeria to the wide African expanse. We bring you what's making headlines, we connect you with news you can use. ANN, African News Network, in a truly African spirit. Welcome back. This is in news. Thousands of miners gathered outside Fountain of Praise Church in Houston, Texas on Monday to pay their final respects and view the casket of 46-year-old George Floyd, whose death under the new of announced act by a police officer has ignited worldwide protests against racism and a call for reform of U.S. law enforcement. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner, U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar, and actor Kevin Hart, um, Hart rather, and rappers Master P and Ludacris were also in attendance. Only 15 masked guests were allowed inside the church at a time, with just 10 minutes to view the body. Floyd will be buried today in Houston next to his mother. His brother, Philemon, says Judge was a huge role model for many people. He called for justice. Just, just being here, just talking, just pain. I just thank y'all so much for coming out to support us. And all the families that are here with me today, Michael Brown, has the public viewing unfolded in Houston, 46-year-old Derek Chauvin, the former police officer charged with second-degree murder in the case, made his first court appearance in Minneapolis by video link. Chauvin has been slumped with a one and a quarter million dollar bill. Correspondent Dan Williams was there. Two weeks to the day since George Floyd's death, the now former police officer Derek Chauvin appeared in court for the first time by video link. The judge set his bail at $1.25 million, or $1 million if Chauvin agrees to conditions. They include surrendering firearms, having no contact with the Floyd family, and not leaving Minnesota without permission. Lawyers left without comment. If we don't get no justice, we don't get no peace. But protesters here and across the country have been making their voices heard. Justice for George Floyd is just not just charge. Charge does not mean conviction. We want him convicted at the highest, highest extent of the law, at the full extent of the law. George Floyd died two weeks ago to the day. Chauvin was videotaped pressing his knee into Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes. Floyd's death sparked major protests across the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Some turned violent with attacks on businesses and buildings. But the protests also brought a wider call for action against police brutality and change, which has since gone nationwide. Three other police officers have also been charged with aiding and abetting Floyd's death. Chauvin and the other officers will appear in court on June 29th. Britain's COVID-19 death toll has risen to almost 52,000. New data for England and Wales brought the toll to 51,766. 
the highest in Europe. Criticisms have been aimed at Prime Minister Boris Johnson for his handling of the pandemic. Opposition parties say he was too slow to impose a lockdown and that he did not provide protection for the elderly in nursing homes. The opposition also accused the Prime Minister of failing to build a test and trace system. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he's making possible progress in reducing COVID-19 fatalities across the United Kingdom. Hong Kong is marking one year anniversary of sustained pro democracy rallies. Leader Carrie Lam has called for peace, just as the city cannot afford for the chaos. The first rally, which attracted more than one million protesters, was triggered by proposed legislation to allow extradition to mainland China, where the courts are controlled by the Communist Party. In a weekly media conference, Lam asked the residents and activists to remember the difficulty caused by unrest in the past one year. 9,000 persons were arrested and more than 600 were charged with rioting in that rally. Activists are planning a the evening protest and would urge a referendum on Sunday on whether to launch a citywide strike against last month's proposed national security laws. Authorities have insisted the legislation would not curb freedoms to hurt investors. Lam has cautioned against the activists' plans to hold a strike referendum. As part of easy lockdown restrictions, France has opened its airport for commercial activities, but with some hygiene measures. Ross Cullen has the details. The Nantes airport is seen as the gateway to this coastal region. It had a successful 2019, with passenger traffic up 17% on the year before. Then the coronavirus pandemic struck. Commercial flights were stopped, so this sector was greatly impacted by the pandemic and some staff were furloughed. We maintained some activities like cargo flights for medical equipment, plus transferring patients and healthcare workers. The airports put in place a protect each other campaign with hand sanitizers, regular deep cleaning in the terminal and social distancing measures. This first day after reopening saw a skeleton schedule, just one flight in and one flight out. My daughter is living with her father and she comes to visit me in the holidays, but she couldn't come in February or April. So as soon as we could book tickets, she jumped on the plane. I haven't seen her for six months. It's been so long. The journey from Lyon to Nantes is an eight-hour drive compared to one hour by plane. So without a flight, it's almost impossible to organize a trip like for a meeting that's going to last a couple of hours. I was supposed to come visit my family in March, but it was cancelled. So I've been waiting for this for so long. Coming by car was not possible, so I'm very happy to fly at last. Regional airports across France were severely impacted by the lockdown. Here in Nantes, in the west of the country, there was a 90% drop in normal activity. But even when the pandemic has passed, things may not return to how they were before. Some areas in France have lots of smaller airports not far apart that could be closed or consolidated. But residents have an attachment to their local airports and politicians have an interest in keeping the runways open. Each uh, politically head of the region just want to keep its airport alive. Even if it costs money, uh, it just gives money to the airport to be there. And you know that, for example, Ryanair also managed to uh, have money from the local uh, politicians in France just to keep having those lines on those uh, non-economically uh, viable airports. European travel restrictions are still in place. So regional airports are hoping the French public will give them a boost and stay inside the country for their summer holidays. Up next, sport. Brazil withdraws 2023 Women's World Cup bid. Please stay with us. You are watching ANN. Whether in your house, at your office, on your phone or online, we are there. We have the facts behind the headlines. We cut to the chase with the news you really need. We cover every angle. We are the bigger, better news network. We are African News Network. ANN. Watch ANN News on MITV from a truly African spirit. 
Welcome back. This is ANN News and Sport. England and Manchester City forward Ryan Sterling is optimistic that an end would come to racism in football when more black managers or when more black players become managers. Sterling says racism is one of the many diseases around the world. He says there needs to be greater black, Asian and minority ethnic representation among administrators and coaching staff in British football and that equal opportunities should be given to former Bain players. Brazil has withdrawn from the list of countries ready to host the 2023 Women's World Cup and is now supporting Colombia, whose domestic league was only founded in 2017. Brazil's withdrawal means Colombia, Japan and a joint bid from Australia and New Zealand are the remaining contenders for hosting the tournament. Brazil has hosted a string of international sporting competitions in recent years, including the World Cup in 2014, the Olympic Games in 2016, and the Copa America last year. That is it in news this evening. Thank you for joining us. For details on these and other breaking stories, visit our website, nnafrica.news. Conversation continues on our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Africa TV. I am Olajimoke Olatunji. Have a pleasant evening.